respected teachers, honorable faculty and distinguished delegates. A very good morning to one and all. Today, we would like to welcome you all to the most awaited third Professor T. Gobinathan Memorial National CME organized by the Department of Dermatology and Venereology, Government Medical College, Korikot, and the Calicut Medical College, Dermatovenereology Alumni Association. The department and the Alumni Association organizes a national CME once in two years to honor the sacred memory of the legendary teacher, Professor T. Gopinathan, who was the founder head of the department. Today, we have eminent faculty to share the knowledge and wisdom on the recent advances in management. We wish you all a great academic feast. An unprecedented situation demands an extraordinary response. The organizing committee is honored to dedicate the CME to our alumni who rose to this occasion and contributed to the fight against the COVID-19 pandemic. Scarring alopecia has scarred the hopes of quite a many souls. We have with us none other than Dr. Murugasundaram S., Founder and Medical Director, Chennai Skin Foundation and Yashudian Research Institute, Chennai, to dwell in detail about the management of this vexing problem. We invite Murugasundaram sir to deliver the first talk of this CME. And we have the non-specific group, which is defined as an idiopathic scarring alopecia, which uh, uh, with inconclusive clinical and histopathological findings, it may include a end stage of variety of inflammatory scarring alopecia. So in my opinion, I will uh, put uh, pseudopalade and many end stage uh, scarring alopecia and a non-specific. And uh, the uh, incidence of uh, cicatrice alopecia in our country is not clearly known. And uh, uh, we have to follow the Western literature and which is very um, common in our country also. And still lichen plano pilaris is the most commonest form of uh, cicatrice alopecia that we see, which accounts for about 33%. And uh, next is the... Uh, Next is the frontal fibrosis alopecia. The frontal fibrosis alopecia is increasingly uh, common. Then you have the non specific cicatrice alopecia, the end stage cicatrice alopecia, and we have the polyclinic prevention. Excuse me, could the organizers mute all of them? Doctor, could you unmute yourself? Yeah. Am I audible? Yes. Yes. So, um, so after the primary scarring alopecia, let us uh, look at the secondary cicatrice alopecia, which are uh, very common and sometimes we miss it. So the literature is filled with examples of misdiagnosis and uh, diagnostic dilemmas. This includes uh, patients presenting with non-scarring, non-inflammatory uh, alopecia, which later are found to be scarring and inflammatory. Even amongst the scarring alopecia, which were diagnosed as scarring alopecia without a biopsy, the role of immune alteration and external factors is still debatable. Much of the confusion is often based in the similarities of the clinical entities, which, uh, which again emphasizes again the importance of not basing the diagnosis on uh, uh, the uh, clinical findings alone. So the secondary cicatrice alopecia can be broadly classified into secondary systemic cicatrice alopecia and secondary localized uh, uh, scarring alopecia, which I already told you the systemic diseases affecting the hair follicles and local incels affecting the hair follicles. The uh, cause of secondary systemic scarring alopecia can be uh, dermatosis like psoriasis and pitreous amyantasia. In my opinion, I haven't seen any scarring in psoriasis, but it is listed under uh, secondary systemic scarring alopecia. Uh, usually the uh, scarring that results in, uh, uh, in uh, um, psoriasis alopecia is usually due to traction and also due to trauma. 
it is not the psoriasis per se which leads to uh, scarring alopecia or even uh, telogen effluvium. In fact, uh, there is an increased antigen uh, induction in psoriasis uh, patients. And uh, pityriasis amyntasia is definitely a cause for uh, cicatricial alopecia. And pityriasis amyntasia can be due to severe seborrheic dermatitis or psoriasis. And uh, when it, uh, when it uh, gets this particular morphology, then scarring is sometimes seen. And uh, pattern hair loss also is one of the uh, uh, listed uh, entities in secondary systemic scarring alopecia and senescent alopecias and uh, granulomatous disorders like sarcoidosis, necrobiosis, autoimmune disorders like bullous disorders, GVHT, scleroderma, uh, lupus erythematosus, lichen sclerosis, atrotypicus, and uh, neoplasias, developmental and hereditary disorders, and um, drugs like busulfan, where about 50% of patients on busulfan chemotherapy develop scarring alopecia. The secondary low-place cicatricial alopecia is very important in our country, where um, uh, people who have hair loss often uh, go to their, uh, often seek home remedies and often seek Google remedies and often do uh, self-medications. So we, we see a lot of scarring alopecia, especially a simple alopecia aerata can be converted to a scarring alopecia by applying herbal irritants. So we have infections like bacterial, fungal, and viral. We have tinea capitis, folliculitis, uh, the uh, uh, bacterial folliculitis, and uh, physical causes like ischemia and uh, uh, pressure alopecia, the post-occipital uh, pressure alopecia, uh, thermal injuries, radiation injuries, uh, burn injuries, uh, traction alopecia. Um, I see very often a uh, lot of this uh, traction cases uh, giving rise to uh, cicatricial alopecia and trichotillomania where the hair is pulled and uh, we, we see sometimes uh, cicatricial alopecia. But the most important uh, thing is to remember a condition called trichotillomania. Trichotiro, tiro mean, uh, means to rub. Uh, instead of uh, tillow means to pull. Instead of pulling the hair and removing it, some children uh, rub it and remove it. And so even some adults do that. It's called trichotiromania. It, it was described in 2004 by uh, Fresh Mitt Mitt. And um, this trichotiromania is a condition where the uh, scalp is vigorously rubbed. And even the eyebrows are sometimes vigorously rubbed. Even the beard area is vigorously rubbed. And even the pubic area is vigorously rubbed. And because of this uh, vigorous friction, um, the alopecia is created and you see a lot of lichenification and it results in a temporary scarring alopecia. And most of this trichotillomania and trichotillomania induced temporary scarring is reversible. And most of the secondary localized cicatrice alopecia is reversible. And that is why I am trying to concentrate more on this because it is better to always uh, know and treat a reversible condition rather than waste our time on an irreversible condition. And uh, the chemicals such as herbal irritants, hair dye, most commonly, we see uh, left, right, center people dye their hair, and we see this uh, PPD allergy, at least uh, uh, two or three cases in a day. And uh, the hot oil, uh, especially uh, in your place like Kerala, a lot of Ayurvedic massage and people are very fond of this uh, uh, hot oil massage on the scalp. And uh, this hot oil uh, produces severe uh, scarring alopecia. But again, if it is identified at the um, earlier stages, it is reversible. And hair straighteners, I have seen a case of hair straightening alopecia and um, and adhesives in this uh, hair pieces also can cause uh, uh, scarring alopecia. The list is endless. So if you are an astute, astute clinician, and if you take proper history and listen to the patient, then you will be able to find out the irritant and you will, you will be able to uh, find out a treatable uh, cause for a cicatric alopecia, which is a very uh, great thing that you are doing for the patient. The gratitude that a patient has um, when the scarring alopecia is treated is, 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 you know, is immensely pleasurable. And uh, you'll have to uh, spend time with the patient. William Osler once said, uh, please listen to the patient. He's telling you the diagnosis. And uh, the most important tool for a, for a dermatotrichologist, especially in handling cicatricial alopecia, is the trichoscope. I usually call this trichoscope as the magic wand of the Harry Potter. The trichoscopy is hair and scalp dermoscopy using a handheld dermoscope. A trichoscope is nothing but an epiluminescent microscope. It is the most essential and simple handy tool, which is a must for every dermatotrichologist. We have a lot of the uh, trichoscopes now available, and I use this uh, Dermlight. 
Um, so what, the, uh, the information that you get from the trichoscope is much more than a hand lens. The currently many magnifications are available from 10X to 70X, but 20X is good enough. The uh, video dermoscopes, uh, which, uh, which magnify uh, in a very um, uh, big manner is not very useful because you get confused. The hair, hair looks uh, sometimes like trees. So you don't get the right information. Small is always beautiful. So use the trichoscope with the 20X magnification. I strongly recommend Dermlight. So the, um, uh, my teacher, Professor Patrick Isudian, used to say, the eyes do not see what the mind does not know. So the treasure of information that the trichoscope gives can be appreciated only when you know what to be seen and what to be discarded. The, uh, you get a lot of information about the scalp morphology, the sebum, scaling, thrusting, subtle inflammation, color changes, atrophy, lichenification, scarring, vasculature, follicular morphosis, perifollicular and peripilar signs. These peripilar signs are very important in uh, cicatricial alopecia diagnosis as well as androgenetic alopecia diagnosis in pattern hair loss and follicular plugging, follicular tufting, the follicular units, which are especially very important for the uh, hair transplant surgeon and empty infant diplomas. The hair morphology, the hair diameter variability, hair shaft defects, even can be very well appreciated by the simple trichoscope. I have devised a technique called trichoscopic trichogram uh, in which you can do a trichogram with a uh, trichoscope. With, within, uh, within a minute or two, you can do a trichogram and you can study the roots and that also can give uh, very valuable information about the uh, alopecia that you are dealing with. And uh, the trichoscopy guided biopsy that gives 95% accuracy of diagnosis. So when you are seeing a case of scarring alopecia, a trichoscope is a must. And uh, trichoscope is also useful for evaluation, diagnosis, disease progression, and monitoring also. So what is most important is to know what is uh, normal and what is abnormal. So what you see here is a normal scalp. What you see here is a sebaceous hyperplasia. Uh, the, to the naked eye, even the sebaceous hyperplasia will look like a normal scalp. But when you look with the uh, trichoscope, you can appreciate the sebaceous hyperplasia. This is the uh, normal scalp with the, uh, which is shaved and you see the stubs of hair which are regrowing. But when the scalp is completely shaven, you see this uh, uh, white dots. These white dots are not to be confused with the white dots of alopecia areata or the pinpoint white dots of cicatrix alopecia. These white dots are just sebaceous prominences, which are very common in the pigmented scalp. All our scalp is, whatever fair, uh, fairness we have, all our scalps are pigmented compared to the Western literature. We always follow the Western literature and we should not carry it away by these white dots or yellow dots. These kind of white dots, which is uh, which represents the sebaceous uh, orifices or the sebaceous prominence um, is very common in the pigmented scalp of ours. This is the um, uh, scalp with uh, severe uh, seborrheic dermatitis, which may look very normal, but when you look at the trichoscope, you can see the uh, scaling and thrusting and the sebaceous uh, hyperplasia. You can see the oily uh, scales and all that. So even a, a subtle case of seborrheic dermatitis cannot be missed uh, when you use a, a trichoscope. So this is to see the um, hair diameter diversity. So here you, this, you see the abnormal um, uh, pictures in trichoscope. You see what you see is this is not the uh, picture that you uh, earlier saw, which is the uh, scaling of seborrheic dermatitis. Here there is uh, much more uh, scaling. There is an alopecia and you have some color change and there is a follicular plugging. So this is the peripilar sign of cicatrix alopecia, especially like in plano pilaris. So you see the follicular plugging. Here you see the follicular plugging and also the violaceous discoloration. You see, you can very, very well uh, appreciate the violations of the discoloration, which is definitely missed by the naked eye examination. And here you see the follicular plugging, there is slight tufting, uh, there is a lot of lichenification, there is atrophy, and there is a lot of scarring that developed. So the lichen plano pilaris is slowly evolving. So this is a tufted folliculitis where lichen plano pilaris has completely scarred the area, and the hair follicles have started tufting and uh, 
That is what you see. So with the trichoscope, you can very easily diagnose sometimes, even without a biopsy, you can ma make a diagnosis of uh, the most common conditions like uh, like in plano pilaris, despite lupal erythematosus, and even frontal fibrosis in the fascia. And here, the pinpoint white dots. These pinpoint white dots are the, the recently described entities in trichoscopy uh, by Antonello Tosti. Uh, this is a very common uh, feature which is seen in uh, the pigmented scalp, uh, which has a scarring alopecia. This is not a normal appearance. These pinpoint white dots are uh, the uh, prominence of the sweat ducts. And you see the black dots and dystrophic hairs and short regrowing hairs of folliculitis decalvins of the pigmented scalp. Here again, the uh, trichoscopic picture of follicular disdecalvins of the pigmented scalp. Here again, the loss of follicular astria is seen in the pigmented scalp. So this, you have to train your eye by seeing a lot of pigmented scalp and then devise your own um, uh, pictures and, uh, you know, like you, your own uh, record of uh, data uh, for your cases. Because if you follow the Western literature, you will be confused, you will be misled. And this is the follicular plugging and the honeycomb pattern. With this honeycomb pattern is very commonly seen in, uh, especially the South Indian scalp. You see this follicular plugging and the honeycomb pattern, which is classical of lichen plano uh, pilaris. And you can see the violaceous uh, coloration around the uh, follicular plugging area, which represents the uh, pigmentary incontinence around the hair follicle. So with that. Trichoscope, you can you can see a lot of things. You can you can you will be exploring a lot of things. You'll be uh, finding out a lot of things which are not even listed in the books or listed in the uh, literature, because each and every case is unique. And uh, there is something called wet trichoscopy because more than the dry trichoscopy, sometimes you get more information on uh, wet trichoscopy when you deal with uh, scarring alopecia. Usually water, alcohol or ultrasound gel is used. The ultrasound gel is the most preferred, it's easily available. And uh, this uh, wet trichoscopy gives very good information on the twisted loops of DLE, dirty dots, red spider anomalies and uh, follicular red dots of DLE. And the, uh, even in LPP, the, uh, the red areas lacking the follicular astria, the perifollicular concentric scaling, elongated vessels, perpendicular to the follicular units, which are all very clear. The wet trichoscopy goes much more uh, deeper than the dried uh, trichoscopy. And in the follicular decalvins, you can see the stardust pattern and tufted follicles, and uh, you can see the grains of paper appearance in the setting folliculitis. So please try uh, doing wet trichoscopy also if you already have uh, the uh, trichoscope in hand. So this algorithm was given by uh, Professor Ralph Trube, and when you have this, um, uh, you see. Um, with a trichoscope and there, when there is an alopecia which is diffuse, then uh, we can go into this. We are not going to go into this because this deals with uh, pattern hair loss and alopecia data. When you have a localized uh, alopecia and you, you uh, when the hair follicle osteo are concentrated, when the hair follicle osteo are intact, then you are dealing with alopecia data. When you have yellow dots and uh, all that, you have alopecia data. When you have black dots and trichoresis, it could be uh, trichotillomania or kenia capitis. When the follicular osteo is lost, here is what is very important for us. When the follicular osteo are lost, we are dealing with scarring alopecia. When the, uh, if you are dealing with the scarring alopecia, then look for the follicular pustules, then look for the follicular hair tufting, then look for the violaceous discoloration, then look for the follicular plex, then look for the pinpoint white dots, then look for the red dots, then you will be able to easily uh, identify the um, uh, type of scarring alopecia dealing with, and then you can uh, do a biopsy, which is again trichoscope guided, so you get a 95% accuracy. And histopathology, as we all know, is the gold standard in cicatric alopecia. Histopathology is inevitable in the diagnosis of scarring alopecia, and it is very important to identify the type of cicatric alopecia because each and every scarring alopecia, the, diagnosis, the, the treatment methodology is slightly different, which we'll be seeing a little later. And what are the vital clues that you ask for from the uh, trichopathologist? As a dermatotrichologist, what should you ask for? You ask for the status as of sebaceous glands, because if this uh, uh, petreous amyntasia, there is an atrophy of sebaceous glands, is there an infiltrate? If at all there is an infiltrate, is it lymphocytic, neutrophilic, or plasmacytic? 
and where is the infiltrate whether it is perifollicular intrafollicular or interfollicular and if at all there is an infiltrate in which um, uh, site of the hair follicle like the the, the uh, trichopathologist should be able to do the vertical sections and the horizontal sections and the horizontal sections should be done at different levels because the um, if the infiltrate is very superficial in the bulb it could be alopecia areata if it is deeper in the bulge area then it could be scarring alopecia and how much infiltrate is present, whether it's mild, moderate, or dense, and how many tracts are fibrous, uh, how many areas are scarred, and how many areas are non-scarred. This is most important for the patient, whether you diagnose or treat, the patient expects regrowth. So you will have to know if the um, uh, scars are fully evolved. If the scars are fully evolved, it is not going to become better at all. If the scars, scars are about 50% in the evolution, then you can try. If the scars are less than 50% in the evolution process, then you can definitely uh, tell the patient that it is reversible. So this is the histopathology in uh, lichen planopilaris as the uh, Lichen planus, you get the uh, dense infiltrate around the hair follicles. And uh, you, uh, this is the uh, histopathology in frontal fibrous glabricia, which is a variant of lichen planopilaris. And you get a little uh, looser infiltrate in frontal fibrous glabricia. And DLE, there is a lot of uh, um, uh, interface changes. And uh, recently, immunohistochemistry is. Uh, uh, very useful in scarring alopecia, especially in uh, differentiating uh, discoid lupus erythematosus from uh, lichen planopilaris. They do the CD123, but this is seldom necessary if, if you do the uh, trichoscopy and if you do uh, proper biopsy, uh, immunohistochemistry may not be uh, necessary for you to diagnose. And while doing the biopsy, as I told you, the trichopathologist should do both horizontal sections and vertical sections. The horizontal section should be at different levels and the upper half and the lower half should be examined, uh, at least two sections and the vertical sections. And uh, vertical sections, which give, uh, will be uh, giving more detail about scarring alopecia and horizontal sections will be giving information about the level of infiltrate in the uh, hair follicle. So this is the bulge area where the, uh, this is the uh, insertion of arachnoidus pylorum muscle and uh, you have this uh, bulge cells. But now, recently, they have identified a lot of stem cell populations all along the hair uh, follicle. So um, um, the uh, scarring alopecia can affect any part of this hair follicle and you can get a scarring alopecia. That is why I told you the secondary scarring alopecia are very important because they are treatable and they are reversible. And uh, as I told you, the horizontal sections tell you about the level of the um, infiltrate. So this gives very good information uh, of, about uh, the uh, clinical condition that you're looking into. And uh, trichoscopy guided biopsy is, uh, is a very, very useful thing. And uh, when you see a case of lichen planopilaris, I told you the follicular plugging and the uh, violaceous discoloration, then you select this area where there are some few hair follicles left and there is a follicular plugging, then you definitely hit at the diagnosis. The histopathology like, um, like the third umpire uh, who gives the uh, most, uh, you know, like uh, clear verdict, uh, you don't miss the uh, target at all. You get the right diagnosis. Uh, similarly, in DLE, when you have this red dots and we have, when you have this uh, uh, changes in the uh, trichoscopy, you select that area and do the biopsy. In frontal fibrosing alopecia, there may not be much scaling. There will be, uh, you know, like uh, you can see something called the lonely hair scene, the lonely hair sign. The hairs are uh, alone and, uh, you know, you, uh, in fact, this is, uh, when, you, when you do a biopsy in this area, you definitely get the uh, correct diagnosis. The pinpoint white dots, which correspond to the sweat glands, again. So what are the pearls from the histopathology of scarring alopecia? The many histopathological features of lymphocytic group are non-specific. The neutrophilic group is very highly specific and uh, they are very often rich in uh, plasma cell infiltrate. Very often for the uh, neutrophilic group, you may have to do a serology. And uh, sometimes you often see four or more, uh, more fused follicles because already the tufting is uh, starting to happen. And sometimes into the, instead of the perifollicular inflammation, you can see interfollicular inflammation and interfollicular fibrosis. When you see interfollicular inflammation, interfollicular fibrosis, then it could be a secondary systemic scarring alopecia. 
and in pitreous cementatia, as I told you, atrophy of sebaceous glands and multinucleate regen cells are seen in pseudopolate. So that is why you do a lot of uh, serology in pseudopolate because it could be still um, um, confused with syphilis and uh, Infant of folliculitis of atopy can mislead to uh, follicular MF. And never forget kinia capitis in scarring alopecias because most of the uh, kirions are opened by the surgeons and they get into a scarring, iatrogenic scarring alopecia. Now let us see in detail about the lichen plano pilaris, which is called as the battle of the bulge. Uh, there is increase in the cytotoxic T cells in the bulge area, destruction of the bulge cells, collapse of the immune privilege, increase MHC1 and 2. Uh, there is proliferation of bulk cells, stem cell exhaustion and depletion. And that is why the calcineurin inhibitors are useful because the uh, preventing the MHC1, they uh, prevent the uh, immune privilege collapse. In the spectrum of lichen planopilaris, you get, uh, uh, you have classical lichen planopilaris, frontal fibrosing alopecia and cicatricial pattern hair loss, which I'll be explaining in detail now. Um, uh, and Graham Little uh, Picardi syndrome. The uh, treatment of lichen plano pilaris is uh, ultrapotent steroids, especially the clopidazole propionate lotions are very useful. Uh, instead of creams, you can use lotions along with the 3% salicylic acid to, uh, to enhance the penetration. And uh, initially for the first month, you use it twice a day and then once a day and then use it on alternate days. The intralational transone sometimes is useful, but I don't do it because in scarring alopecia, already the scalp uh, skin is very thin and you don't uh, um, uh, make it uh, much more thinner, but you can reserve these intralational uh, injections for a very, very severe case or recalcitrant cases. Topical calcineurin inhibitors are very useful. You have this tacrolimus lotions nowadays available, which are very useful than the creams and the ointments. And uh, topical minoxidil is always useful because it, in, uh, it induces some hair growth, even in uh, scarring on a fish hair. And um, it also reduces the uh, perifollicular fibrosis because the in the pathogenesis of uh, pattern hair loss, I would have uh, told you in my uh, previous lectures, uh, minoxid, the, the, there is a, a loose concentric fibrosis around the hair follicles, even in pattern hair loss. So minoxidil is useful by reducing this uh, uh, follicular streamers and the perifollicular uh, loose concentric fibrosis. So minoxidil is definitely an adjuvant in scarring alopecia also. Imiquimod also is uh, useful, but I haven't tried that. Uh, this is uh, one of the results of scarring alopecia in, uh, in about, it takes long, lot of time. You'll have to counsel the patient. You'll have to be very uh, patient along with the patient. You also should be patient and the patient also should be patient. Then you can uh, see some good results. This is after two years. And uh, Systemic agents, since hydroxychloroquine is the gold standard and uh, cyclosporin, a lot of reports, but I, I don't use it much. Mycophenolate, mofetil is also safer than cyclosporin, but I don't use it much. I use a lot of pioglitazone, which is very useful. I use a lot, lot of doxycycline, which is very useful. And uh, thalidomide, there are a lot of good reports, but I don't use, use much. Retinoids, I don't use much. Tetracyclines, I don't use much. Griseofalin, I don't use. And dapson, I don't use. I don't have any... Uh, clinical experience on this. But with hydroxychloroquine and uh, pioglitazone and doxycycline, uh, the results are extremely good. I will tell you a, a treatment regime which you can follow very simply. Hydroxychloroquine is still the very useful drug and uh, the dosage is 200 milligrams twice a day, that is 400 milligrams per day. And uh, it takes at least two to three months for it to start to work and maximum efficacy is seen in six months. It can be given for a very long time. Uh, without any adverse effects. You just have to uh, check the uh, macular atrophy of the uh, eye. You'll have to uh, refer to the ophthalmologist every six months. And uh, hydroxychloroquine is very effective. And uh, there are a lot of reports on that. And uh, cyclosporin is, uh, seems to be effective. Mycophenol and mofetilis seems to be effective. And this is very important. Recently, uh, Dr. Pratima Karnik, uh, had uh, identified this PPAR gamma down regulation in lichen plano pilaris. And that is why the glitazones are very useful because they increase the activity of PPAR gamma. And I have used this PPAR gamma at the dosage of 15 milligrams per day in uh, lichen plano pilaris and even in frontal fibrosis alopecia with very, very good results. And uh, which very, very less side effects. I haven't seen any side effect with uh, this PPAR gamma inhibitors. Thalidomide seems to be very useful. and. Uh, I haven't used that. 
low dose excimer laser heart transplant skull production surgery because heart transplant is a very tricky thing in uh, uh, scarring lopecias because already the uh, skin is scarred and uh, there is no vasculature uh, there is very less vasculature the, the the skin is very thin and uh, as an ethical uh, uh, dermatotrichologist, I wouldn't advise a uh, heart transplant in a, in a, in a, in a psychiatric lopecia patient. Biologics are useful. Rituximab is supposed to be useful. I haven't used uh, uh, so far. and uh, But you should remember that etanacept and infliximab can induce LPP. Pyoglitazone, the results of pyoglitazone. Results of pyoglitazone, both uh, clinically and trichoscopically. Frontal fibrosing alopecia is a very interesting condition, which was described by Cossard in 1994. In 1997, he revised it as a frontal variant of lichen planopilaris. In 2010, he suggested that there is a link with pattern alopecia. And uh, there is a frontotemporal broadening band of smooth cicatrice alopecia with loss of eyebrows, predominantly in postmenopausal women, uh, very, which is increasingly common in our country also. Originally reported to be very rare in Asians, but we see a lot of cases of this frontal fibrosis alopecia in our country now. There is peripheral erythema and my minimal scaling. There is a recession of frontal airline, temporal airline, but intact occipital airline. And uh, there is peripheral dense lymphocytes with colloid bodies, destruction of the frontal temporal air follicle by T lymphocytes. FFA can occur in men also. I have seen few cases in men also. And there is circumference, circumferential fibrosing alopecia, which is an extension of. Uh, frontal fibrosing alopecia, and usually there are no LP lesions outside the, outside the scalp, except one case reported by Andrew Lello Tosti, where there, there are LP uh -huh. lesions outside the scalp. This is a classical frontal fibrosing alopecia. You see the frontotemporal band with very minimal uh, scaling, very minimal uh, trichoscopic findings. So classical frontal fibrosing. This is a very important, useful sign for lonely hair sign described by Antonella Tosti. You see this lonely hair sign in all the cases of frontal fibrosing alopecia. This will strike at you. When you see the patient, you cannot miss this. If you see a lonely hair sign, then it is frontal fibrosing alopecia with the frontal band. So you can see the lonely hair sign here. And recently they say frontal fibrosing alopecia may run in families. It can be uh, in uh, identical twins. And it can also affect uh, other than scalp, extra uh, scalp uh, frontal fibrosing alopecia like hair loss in the limbs can happen. It can also happen after the cosmetic procedures and transplant uh, surgeries. It also leads to uh, hypopigmentation, uh, vitiligo like uh, depigmentation. So uh, it again suggests the strong autoimmune uh, pathogenesis. Sometimes LPP, this is the case by uh, Tosti. Uh, hello, sorry, yeah. sir. Uh, we have uh, short of uh, time. Uh, yeah. I'm going to finish now. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you so much. And you sometimes have uh, lichen planus pigmentosis. So in frontal fibrosing alopecia, finasteride is very useful. Now, normally, I use about 5 milligram per day, uh, which is useful in frontal fibrosing alopecia. Oral finasteride, 5 milligrams. Immunomodulators are useful. Pyoglitazone is useful. Hydroxychloroquine, doxycycline, uh, same as LPP. Heart transplant sometimes. And uh, this is very interesting. The frontal fibrosing alopecia recently, there is a link with pattern hair loss. Though the uh, patient presents like uh, uh, androgenetic alopecia, but on biopsy, you reveal uh, that it is frontal fibrosing alopecia. So there is a link with frontal fibrosing alopecia. And recently, this condition is called as cicatricial pattern hair loss. So sometimes when, uh, when there is a very prominent alopecia in an in inappropriate setting, you do a biopsy and then you find this scarring alopecia where it could be cicatricial pattern hair loss. And uh, there is also a doubt that whether AGA is an evolving cicatrix because there is perifollicular fibrosis in androgenetic alopecia also. And rapidly progressive diffuse fibrosing alopecia is again a new entity. 
And because of this uh, immune modulator theory, the JAK inhibitors are supposed to be useful and uh, they are uh, potential uh, therapeutic agents both in the lichen planus pilaris as well as from the fibrosis of the Scalp psoriasis, they say that can lead to scarring alopecia only because of trauma and uh, the uh, traction, but not due to psoriasis per se. And then uh, permanent alopecia vesely. These are all secondary systemic scarring alopecia. This is the perifollicular micro inflammation, which is uh, represented by the brown halos around the hair follicle, which represents the perifollicular micro inflammation. So, is androgenetic alopecia also an evolving psychiatrix? That's a million dollar question. The role of microbial inflammation. So, you often need to give antibiotics in the treatment of scarring alopecia. So, fibrosing alopecia and pattern distribution that is what you see in end stage. The erectoris pylorum muscle uh, uh, is a very interesting area because that is the area where the uh, where, where the bulk cells are present. So stimulating electro erectoris pylorum muscle may be a new uh, treatment uh, um, horizon for uh, cicatrice alopecia as well as androgenetic alopecia. Hair restoration surgery, CTOD. Now we come to secondary scarring. We are, uh, we are seeing last few slides of my presentation. This is a, a young lady who presented with a severe itchy bald patch and uh, excoriations and crusted patrols. Um, and uh, this is a man who had uh, who was using this herbal hair colors and developed uh, this scarring alopecia. So you can see the tufting of follicles here. This is a lady who had applied a, a hot oil and then combed vigorously. So these are all due to the irritants applied, uh, usually the onion juice, garlic paste on the growth. The first case is due to proton oil. This is the herbal scarring alopecia. In many centers and many salons, they use this proton tiglium, which is a very fatal uh, poison in uh, neonates. It is applied on the scalp. It produces, this is a proton uh, oil. Just for two rupees, you get uh, so much of seeds, which is a uh, uh, poison which, will, which can kill a group of children. I did a study, and this is the, uh, uh, immediately after applying this proton oil, a severe personal reaction. So this is stage one, where the acute inflammation is present. This is stage two, when the inflammation is moderate, when the inflammation has already happened. This is stage three, the chronic stage. So this is exactly, we also did the histology of these cases, and we found that uh, the histopathology is similar to lichen plano pilaris, a non-specific histopathology with a lot of lymphocytic infiltrate, sometimes mixed infiltrate also neutrophilic. So these stages, the uh, acute stage when it is treated, it's completely reversible. The histopathology of the acute stage, you get neutrophilic and eosinophilic. Eosinophilic infiltrate is present because of the irritants and the uh, drugs that are applied there. Second stage, lymphocytic and eosinophilic infiltrate. Third stage, where there is a lot of fibrosis and sparse infiltrate. So the third stage is irreversible. So it is very important to identify the reversible cases at the early st stages and you have to treat uh, immediately. And black henna, which is an unholy combination of uh, henna and PTD, which usually produces severe uh, scarring location. That was the second case which is shown uh, in the uh, display. Henna is also a second person. And even uh, this uh, temporary tattoos uh, also can produce scarring location. Something it is called as henapecia. The alopecia due to henna is called henapecia. And this is due to the black henna, the unholy combination of PPD and uh, henna that produces severe scarring alopecia. So you do a patch test and you get a violently positive uh, patch test reaction for PPD and uh, henna combination. This is uh, the black henna user almost uh, having a, a alopecia mimicking frontal fibrosis alopecia but you see the absence of lonely hair sign. This is a pigmented uh, dermatitis due to black henna, even on the scalp. So to summarize, uh, 
primary scarring and appreciates and even secondary scarring and appreciates the trichological emergencies to reach accurate diagnosis. You will, uh, the uh, clinical pathological correlation is very important. And uh, the, uh, um, they are also called as lichenoid scarring and appreciates because both LPP and FFA are very common. And aggressive therapy is very important and uh, most uh, required and uh, many therapeutic alternatives are available. But I tell you a simple regime. When you see a scarring alopecia, if it is a lymphocytic scarring alopecia, if it is LPP or frontal fibrosing alopecia, you put them on hydroxychloroquine 400 milligrams per day, that is 400 doses, and you put them on topical lotion and topical uh, steroid lotions, and uh, you just uh, continue. On and off, you can give some intramuscular triamcinone and acetonide to watch the progress. On and off, you can also give antibiotics. If you're seeing a neutrophilic, that is folliculitis decalvans, add along with the same regimen, add isotretinoin and antibiotics. And if you're seeing some other uh, cases, add other alternatives. So this is a basic uh, regimen to treat uh, scarring alopecias. So there are uh, trichological emergencies, histopathology is a gold standard, trichoscopy is very, very useful, and uh, you have to assess properly, assure the proper, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, what is, uh, assure the reality, don't assure something uh, which, which you cannot do, and act immediately. And secondary localized scarring and pressure is very, very important, so you'll have to identify because it is reversible in early cases. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir, for such an informative session. Due to paucity of time, we don't have discussions for this session. Thank you. Sir, when it comes here, so good answer. Thank you, thank you. The Department of Dermatology and Venereology, Government Medical College, Kohikot, has welcomed the 50th batch of both graduates in 2021. On this occasion, the Alumni Association and the Department remember with gratitude our great teachers who molded generations of students into. The Department of Dermatology and Venereology, Government Medical College, Kohikot, welcomed the 50th batch of postgraduates in 2021. On this occasion, the Alumni Association and the Department remember with gratitude our great teachers who molded generations of students into efficient, caring, and responsible dermatologists. With immense pleasure, we pay tribute to our legendary teachers through an interactive session, Meet the Doyens. The department expresses sincere gratitude to our alumni association for their wholehearted support without which it would have been impossible to fulfill this dream. In this session, our great teachers share their experiences and provide solutions to meet today's challenges. We have edited the videos to keep up with the time schedule, but a complete version of these videos would soon be made available to our alumni. We begin our program with Lakshmi Madam. Dr. Renuga meets Lakshmi Madam for this session. It's my privilege to be with Dr. Lakshmi Vinaya, former professor and HOD, Department of Dermatology, Government Medical College, Kolkata. She is an eminent teacher, a great academician with in-depth, updated knowledge and clinical skills. Ma'am, you are the teacher of teachers. Can you share your experience over that? I realize that I have had a very long innings and still I continue to teach. I've been rather fortunate to have some very extremely um, clever postgraduates and teaching them I, it has been a real pleasure. You know, I still remember the case discussions we had where we discussed each case at length threadbare and it was a pleasure for me and the students alike because it was done in an atmosphere without fear. They could ask me anything they wanted 
and I would try my level best and so there were times when I had to say that I don't know, I'll refer back, I'll refer and get back to you. Should focus in molding the current and budding dermatologists. I think the teachers should always have an have a quest for knowledge. Yes. And uh, once a teacher, I think it's always a student, yes. because learning is such a continuous process. The more we learn, the more we forget. So the teachers should really be interested and. Uh, they should not be a medium whereby the facts from the textbooks are doled out to the student's notebook, I would say. They should be able to inculcate in the students an inquiring mind, an analyzing mind, where they should be able to seek out the answers which are rational and they should be able to apply it into their day-to-day -day practice. And uh, dermatology has developed so fast across the years because when we joined dermatology was a much looked down upon speciality yes. and today it's the cream yes. among the medical specialities and with this um, what to say I would say that uh, there should be a perfect blend of clinical dermatology and advances in term technology when you support one at the expense of the other I would say today we tend to support more of cosmetology, dermatosurgery and, and so on. Branches like yeah, and other branches. Neg and dermato clinical dermatology is often neglected. And many a times when the budding dermatologist is out from the medical college, all the aim is how to set up a cosmetology practice. Yes. But then the vast majority of patients are dermatology patients. So we should not sacrifice clinical dermatology for other, for other branches. enriching branches of dermatology, so to say, because this forms the backbone. So we should not sacrifice one for the other. I thank the Department of Dermatology, Calicut Medical College and the Alumni Association for giving me this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Renuka, very much. It was nice interacting with you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for your nice advice. Thank you. And uh, here is ma'am, uh, a small token of appreciation from our side. Thank you so much. In our next video in the series on Meet the Doyens, Pavitran sir shares his experiences with Dr. Srivichu. Good day to all of you. Today we are going to meet one of the doyens of dermatology. A person who lives for dermatology, who has instilled the passion for dermatology into his students. Professor Dr. K. Pavitran, Emeritus Professor, Government Medical College, Calicut. Good morning, Good sir. Good morning, ma'am. Sir, could you please share your uh, vast experiences as a teacher to us? I told you, you no, know, I was working in various government medical education, Kotayam, Trivandrum, Alapuri, and Calicut. And uh, 13 years I had been there in Kotayam. And uh, my professor was uh, Dr. P. Ramendra Naya. He is no more with us. To do respect, I'm saying he encouraged me to publish papers. Each time a new case comes, he shows me and he asks him, ask me to publish it. Okay, and uh, I had a total of 300 publications, 50 publications, uh, in various Indian journals. Then uh, some 20, about 20 were there in uh, international journals. And uh, sir, at that time it was not that easy to publish an article yeah. in a international journal yeah. yeah. as it is now, no sir? Mm. That's difficult. Their scrutiny is very, very important, you know. They send the article to some other for opinion and all. Then only publish it. Sir, so, uh, I think you are very interested and very keen about researches and all. So how, how, how did you, how could you carry out uh, researches at that time, uh, was it easy or was it a very no, My problem? studies were mainly clinical. And I told you, you know, I mean, this, uh, for example, now somebody can take up the incidence of telogenofluvium in COVID. Okay. So there you need not get a uh, test and all. Okay, okay. That is a clinical, like that any rash incoming. This all should be given to our scientific knowledge. Okay. So you had faced a lot of difficulties when you were doing and I had a good support from my teachers, my uh, co-workers, 
and the post graduates also they help me a lot some of the journals i put their name also as co author the so post graduates also okay so it was basically a teamwork with a teamwork yes right and you got lot of uh, help support from, from okay teachers no so what all other things uh, can you uh, share with us your uh, college days which i think uh, might motivate the younger generation some words uh, of motivation um, always uh, be in a happy mood you know in the department the teachers should give uh, uh, maximum support to the post graduate students they are budding in the budding stage so don't first day of coming to the college don't, don't shout and against him so tell them what is all things we are doing in dia i my teachers were very polite to me gobinath sir you know he was the first teacher for me he definitely encouraged me see he is a disciplinarian you know uh, well, discipline is very important for gobi sir at 8 o'clock when i come there he will be sitting there in the table only in his presence i had to sign every department the department was very good at that time you know even now it does no problem they are all now they are all students of officer sodan sir and all sort of teacher so so what you are trying to say is discipline is discipline and punctuality is also very, oh, very important. important not only love and affection right but in the department nobody was uh, and uh, against this you know so uh, what is your opinion on about the uh, older modalities of treatment such as topical uh, treatments compared with the new modalities of treatment so do you feel that the older modalities of treatment like topical therapies which are actually not uh, so favorite among patients yeah so what do you, what do you yeah. feel about it you not only among uh, patients even among the doctors nobody gives coltar on when the hydrogram uh, ammonia and all these things i still use you uh, medicine say we may must have seen my prescription yes, like carpisis carpogen every patient may psoriasis patients that i give then uh, uh, paste and all all made in the pharmacy okay, okay. Uh, even if you even if you want to give steroid we give only a small dose okay. otherwise patient will apply steroid alone for a long time that will cause create problems but to tell them that uh, this is a good medicine you get a response very slowly but it will be more loss, long lasting than the immediate benefits given by the present medicines thank you despite effective treatment sexually transmitted infections remain a problem of public health importance mostly owing to the stigma associated with the disease and the reluctance of the infected to seek timely help to deliver the presentation on changing trends in stis we have with us the authority on the topic dr k ajit kumar professor department of dermatology and venereology government medical college thrissur over to you sir respected teachers senior colleagues and friends i am happy to deliver this talk in a cme which is established in memory of professor of dr t gobinathan who is the teacher of teachers of dermatologists in india the talk is on changing trends in sci there are a lot of challenges you have to face when it when we talk about changing trends of sci's in india the main challenge is paucity of proper data whatever data we have from this region is fragmented data uh, collected as part of retrospective studies done in referral centers of various parts of india there are very few community based studies done on this so we cannot extrapolate trends from those studies and any data from a referral hospital is bound to have a referral bias and diagnostic bias programmatic issues like change in the diagnostic criteria 
change in approach in prevention, etc., can affect the data. For example, we may not have any data on gonococci as a diagnosis because syndromic approach discuss only on total discharge uh, of male and females. We may not have a diagnosis of Chancroy because syndromic approach have a diagnosis of dental ulcer disease only. And social political issues which happened uh, during this time also can affect the referral and the incidence and prevalence of diseases. For example, the recent verdict legalizing uh, MSR uh, probably has reduced the stigma against MSM uh, and probably has made more people uh, to attend health facilities. We all know all these uh, STIs, most of these STIs have a history from uh, last many centuries. So at least gonorrhea, herpes, are known from uh, probably prehistoric days. Uh, chlamydia is uh, a recent STI, but and HIV too. Uh, before going to the STIs, let me just, just touch upon HIV as an STI. Uh, with the advent of ART and control of the disease uh, as a disease which causes mortality, we started considering that HIV is no more an issue of concern. But that's not true. The last 10 years, the reduction is in HIV incidence is only 23 percent. There are millions of people still getting infected uh, in various parts of the world. And interestingly, the reduction is only 12 percent in uh, Asia. Okay. So HIV is still an issue of concern. And we have around 35 million individuals affected by HIV. And the, as ART is going to be effective, the prevalence of HIV will increase. And most of this infection happens as an STI. Considering other STIs, and just touch upon the international scenario on the trends of STI from some data available. Uh, one of the uh, studies from WHO shows there's actually no significant change in the incidence of various treatable STIs in the last uh, decade, remaining almost the same. The difference is not very significant. In UK, this uh, data from UK also shows the treatable STIs remains almost the same with a small difference uh, between the years, like uh, chlamydia showing small dip here uh, in 2020. Uh, these graphs from various countries, China, Europe, and USA also shows the difference uh, in the incidence of new cases of STIs is not uh, really that great and it remains between 1.5 to 5 cases per 1 lakh population. There are small blips and dips, uh, but it's not a huge to uh, say that uh, there's a changing trend in the uh, incidence of STI in the last few years. Though some clinics are showing a significant change in some cases, like for example, syphilis and this clinic, 
in united kingdom show significant number uh, of syphilis in the last in 2002 2001 2 and 3 uh, again this is this data is from london in the last few years it's almost remains same with some uh, blips it's us data on chlamydia shows a steady increase but it's not an exponential increase a steady increase in number of chlamydia chlamydia but in europe it remains almost the same as far as gonorrhea is concerned that's as again small ups and downs uh, but the change is from only 200 to 400 cases out of a million uh, so there are ups and downs but it's not uh, a huge change between the years as far as drug resistance to gonorrhea is concerned uh, around 40 percent of the prophylaxis in resistance to cefixim and ceftrioxone cephalosporins are almost nil even though there are a few case reports as far as india is concerned we don't have aggregate data so i depend on studies from various institutions over the years this is one of the early studies in late 70s which shows most all STIs diagnosed in these clinics are bacterial STIs with uh, syphilis having maximum numbers, followed by gonorrhea, chandroid, LGV, etc. In 80s, PJ shows, showed an increase in condyloma accumulator, followed by gonorrhea, chandroid, and syphilis. But at the same time, Udaipur continue to have bacterial STIs as predominant STIs. In the next decade, Katak shows hepatitis as the predominant STI followed by syphilis. So is Vadodara in the West. That means by 1990s, hepatitis and viral STIs has taken a precedence over bacterial STIs. This study from Delhi is not published, but it's a presentation in one of the conferences. Uh, again, shows by 2000, by early, late 90s, the decline in bacterial studies among genital ulcers uh, is happening. And by 2000, we have uh, more number of herpes dentalis as genital ulcers. And non genital ulcer STI is also condylum accumulator uh, has uh, uh, on the cross, uh, has a higher number compared to bacterial STIs. So by 2000, probably we, our, we are following the Western trend of controlling bacterial STIs but wireless TVs are continuing. Probably the HIV control measures and strategies controlling STIs uh, as part of HIV control also had an impact on this. Unfortunately, many of the studies uh, on STIs in India doesn't mention HIV as an STI. And in 90s, the study from South Pondicherry also shows a uh, trend towards increasing number of viral STIs with dental herpes and condyloma being predominant STIs. This study shows a uh, glance across the years, again showing a 
increase in hepatitis percentage from 7.3 to 12. Uh, syphilis decreasing from 2.6 to 0.3. LGV from 0.4 to 0. Anogenital ward 6.8 to remaining at 6.6. Gonococcal urethritis from 3 to 1.2. It again shows that it is not increasing viral STI happening. It is a decrease in bacterial SCS, which happened in 2090s and 2020s, probably because of availability of the antibiotics and better STI uh, treatment available through programs and clinics. As far as antimicrobial resistance is concerned, we are following the same trend. Uh, by 2000, uh, we, can, we can see here this profiloxin resistance has reached almost 90%. And what ceftriaxone resistance is unknown or practically zero. Uh, another study which compiled many of the available studies at that point of time also shows a similar trend with the syphilis decreasing from 29 in 80s, almost 30 percentage in 80s to one point, almost two percentage. And cordyloma accumulator from 12 to 14 and dental herpes from 11 to 15 and virtual disappearance of chancroid and uh, LG and donovans. Coming to Kerala, First study uh, which I would project here is by Govalishan sir and his team, which shows and uh, the predominant STI being syphilis, especially uh, the latent syphilis. We continue to see a large number of latent syphilis in our STI clinics, probably because they are being referred to as as being detected during their um, migration to the Gulf or a, a part of antenatal checkup. Uh, and, and, it, uh, and this study from Cotem in 2005 also shows a decrease in number of bacterial STIs by 2000 and small increase in the viral STIs. So the same trend is continuing. The study or trends of bacteria of STIs in Calicut Medical College over the last 20 years shows some interesting uh, findings. All throughout from 1990s, we had higher number of viral STIs compared to bacterial STIs. And the linear trend of syphilis shows a small increase in the uh, last few years, five years. Uh, and this is predominantly again for latent syphilis or late, uh, late syphilis compared to early syphilis. As far as uh, herpes dentalis is concerned, it's, it's remaining almost the same with a small increase in decrease in numbers over the years. And Cordyloma acuminata is actually decreasing in number. So it again shows we have some, some like good control over bacterial STIs, but not viral STIs. Gonorrhea, again, the number of gonorrhea cases we see is very small. This year we had zero cases. In 2007 we had zero cases. Last year we had in 2017 we had one case. So gonococcal cases case also are coming down. Uh, uh, and NGO we don't have good data from whatever is available. Again, there are almost more only two or three cases of NGO diagnosed in our clinic. Uh, but why this is happening, we don't know. Probably they're getting treatment outside. 
and uh, as far as uh, Kerala is concerned, TI pro programs and presumptive treatment of high risk uh, groups are very much effective. Almost every town in Kerala has at least one or two TI projects actively uh, working with FSWs and uh, MSMs. Uh, so probably that also is uh, helping us in controlling these STAs. Since the previous study showed only data till 2007, I just collected the data available from Calcutt Medical College. Uh, that also shows the same trend, but there's a small increase in numbers of syphilis in 2019. We don't know why this happened. Uh, so I just tried to collect uh, data, state data from Kerala, it's controlled society. Interestingly, that also shows that uh, some increase in numbers in 2019-20. Uh, we don't know what exactly happened here. And uh, in 2020-21, the numbers are coming back to the pre-19 number. But we don't know what is the impact of COVID here. Uh, did we miss some cases in 2021 due to COVID epidemic? Uh, is it actually going up? We don't know. Probably we will know by next year's stats. So, so we should be a little careful about this data. That's what I feel. Uh, as far as chlamydia is concerned, very, there is very limited data about uh, uh, the chlamydia prevalence or incidence in uh, STI group. Uh, but this is what I could gather. Around 20 to 30 percentage uh, of STI clinic attendees have uh, uh, Chlamydia infection. And this study shows 23%, but that's a definite error of bias here because it is done among FSWs in Mumbai, not in STA clinic. But still, chlamydia is there. Probably we are not addressing that adequately. Uh, I just had a glance about uh, what's happening in MSA. There's a definite increase in STS, especially chlamydia uh, and uh, syph uh, syphilis in MSM in UK. And USA also shows the majority of STIs are happening in MSM compared to uh, heterosexuals. The total number of STIs significantly more in MSM. Uh, one of our PGs did an interesting study uh, recently among MSM uh, clients of our STA clinic at Trichur. The numbers are very small, but it shows a sharp increase of cases uh, with MSM uh, orientation uh, post-1980. I don't think this is because there's an increase in MN, people with MSM orientation uh, in the last two years. Probably this is the impact of the legalization or decriminalization of MSM activities in the country. They are, it's so uh, homosexuality is destigmatized and they are ready to come to the clinics now. And interestingly, we see the reluctance to accept uh, MSM orientation has significantly come down in the last two or three years. There's definite increase, uh, uh, proportionate uh, increase of uh, syphilis and condyloma among uh, MSM compared to heterosexuals in our clinic too. And uh, it's around 10 times more in Amazon compared to heterosexuals. And there's nothing new. This is a non. And this also uh, occurs in HIV and other STIs also world over. So in summary, 
there's a definite change from bacterial STAs to viral STA in the lab from since 1990s. There's virtual absence of LGV donovanosis and chancroid in the last few years. Chlamydia is a probably a significant problem in India too, but we don't have enough data and we are not probably addressing that uh, in the national program. HIV continues to be an issue of concern, which probably we are sort of becoming complacent in the last few years. There is some apparent increase in cases of syphilis from some clinics. Uh, but is it really significant? We are not sure. So we should be on watch. And this uh, happened probably secondary to the HIV control activities and uh, considering STI control as part of HIV control in the last few years. Initial days of HIV control, we thought uh, Awareness and barrier is the way out. Later, we added ART and hope uh, to bring patients uh, to the clinics and facilities. Uh, but now, what we are doing is adding ART and PREP as a prevention, prevention strategy to prevent HIV. That is good. But the problem is, we are probably giving less trust to condoms and behavior change. So with PRIP, you cannot prevent STIs. So there's a chance of STI being uh, missed out from the strategy and uh, an increase in STIs, even though we are controlling HIV. This should not happen. The, and most of our STA and HIV prevention strategies depend on communication and activities in TI, targeted interventions. Most of the targeted interventions work among the street-based commercial sex workers or MSM communities. But in the last few years, social media is the most common and important uh, area where negotiations and communications happen. So unless we enter into social media with prevention strategies, our conventional strategies may not work. And we can see drug menace is spreading all across India. And what is in store for us in this, we don't know. A combination of social media, drug, and STIs can be deadly. So what should be our future? Like STDs are under control, we can control them, we can treat them. Probably we need to stress on syphilis and chlamydia, and uh, we should have more interventions among MSM. Interventions through social media is important. We may have to go, uh, go for unconventional uh, media strategies involving social media, electronic media, etc. Probably we may have to think about universal immunization, the HPV, at least to high risk population. Uh, newer awareness strategies are important. For that, we need appropriate data. We need diagnosis-based data, community-based data uh, among at least the high-risk groups uh, to plan our strategy. As far as syndromic approach is concerned, I am for syndromic approach. I was supporting a syndromic approach, but probably we need to change the strategy to control STIs because uh, we don't see GUDs, bacterial GUDs, only herpes we see. Uh, so that syndrome, uh, gentle ulcer syndrome is, uh, is only gentle ulcers, herpetic uh, gentle ulcers. 
large number of asymptomatic cities we do see and they don't present to us with uh, genital ulcers and many syphilis persons either asymptomatic or with a skin rash which may not be picked up as a GUD. Our system, the syndromes doesn't pick up, probably it's not picking up chlamydial infections. And even though there's a mechanism to treat it in the syndromic approach, and I think HPV is not getting adequate attention as part of the syndromic approach. Uh, Non-HIV STAs are to be addressed as a different issue. It's not as part of HIV only, especially in the era of PREP and ART. Thank you. Thank you once again, uh, Dr. Devi and team for inviting me for this talk. Thank you, sir, for that very interesting and informative lecture. Next, we move on to the most awaited official inaugural function of the day. Let's begin the ceremony by invoking the blessings of God Almighty. We welcome Dr. Gina G, our alumnus and consultant dermatologist to lead us in prayer. <laughs> Thank you, madam. <clears throat> lives of great men all remind us we can make our lives sublime and departing leave behind us footprints on the sands of time. Raman sir was a great teacher, a philosopher, scholar and a great human being. Sir was a pillar of support not only to his students but also to all those who needed his help. Thomas Koshi, sir, retired as the professor and head of the department, Department of Dermatology and Venereology, Government Medical College, Kurikud, in 2002. A strict disciplinarian, sir was a great teacher and an efficient administrator. The Alumni Association and the Department of Dermatology pay homage to our great teachers. Next, we invite Dr. Devi K. Professor and Head of the Department of Dermatology and Vendrology, Garden Medical College, Cody Court, to deliver the welcome note and presidential address. Respected teachers, senior colleagues, and friends, a warm good morning to all of you. Today, we are proud to present in front of you the third edition of this prestigious national CME in the name of our professor, Dr. Gobinadan, sir. First of all, I welcome our principal, Dr. S Dr. Rajendran, sir, who is a strong pillar of support for us and who has kindly agreed to inaugurate this session. 
I also welcome Dr. Sri Jain, Superintendent NMCH, who has honored us by his presence today. I'm happy to welcome our Professor Dr. Sugadin Sir, who is a stalwart in dermatology and also a teacher of many of us teachers. Sir is giving the keynote address today. I'm also happy to welcome our Professor Dr. Safiya Madam, who is delivering the uh, alumni oration today. I'm happy to welcome our teacher, our respected Professor Narayani Madam, and our esteemed alumnus, Dr. George Kurian, who is president of IEDVL Kerala at present, and all other teachers who have joined us today for this program. I'm happy to welcome all the esteemed faculty who have agreed to uh, enlighten us today with their wisdom and knowledge. I welcome all the alumni members and all other dermatologists who have joined us today for this CME from the various parts of the country. Professor Dr. Gobinadin Sir is a legend of modern dermatology. He, he was the professor and director. He was the pro director and professor of our department from the year 1956 to 1987. He was instrumental in starting PG course in dermatology in the state of Kerala uh, for the first time in our department at Calicut. He was the founder president of IADVL Kerala, and he has also adorned the position of national president of IADVL. Sir departed us in the year 2016 on April 13th. At this juncture, when our department has reached the age of 50 years, we are proud to announce that, that our department achieved a historic victory in the university examination of 2021. All our six MD candidates and three diploma candidates backed all the top ranks in the university examination. We place this victory at the feet of our great teachers who paved the way forward for us. Wishing you all a very enjoyable time ahead. Let me conclude now. Jai Hind. Thank you, Madam. Next, we invite Dr. V. R. Rajendran, Principal, Calicut Medical College, to officially inaugurate the CME and deliver the inaugural address. Respected teachers, dear friends, colleagues, and students, very good morning to all. Really, I'm happy to join the online CME program, Dr. T. Gobinath Memorial National CME, arranged by the Department of Dermatology and Venerology, Government Medical College, Kodikot, in association with the uh, Calicut Medical College Dermatology Alumni Association. First, I have to congratulate the department headed by Dr. Devi Madam to arranging a program like this one. As all of you know, during the COVID pandemic, everyone is busy and also getting tired. During this pandemic period, arranging a CME program in the department, definitely helpful to the PG students who are getting very little exposure during the pandemic period. The Dr. T. Gobiansa was my teacher when I was an undergraduate student. Even now, I am remembering the very good classes taken by this uh, during the spirit. Now, today we have a lot of eminent speakers from various states and hope the classes will definitely enrich the knowledge of our students, and I wish all the success for this program and declare that the program is inaugurated. Okay, thank you. Thank you, sir. It is a moment of great pride and honor to acknowledge the hard work and success of the deserving and the best outgoing student award, Dr. K.K. Nambiar Award, was instituted in this regard by one of our outstanding alumni, Dr. T.C. Sadish, in the memory of his grandfather, Dr. K.K. Nambiar. Now, we present before you the best outgoing student of the year 2020, Dr. Lulua Safar. 
Now we request our beloved principal, Dr. Rajendran sir, to hand over the memento to Dr. Lulua. Thank you, sir. And we request Devi Madam, our beloved HOD, to hand over the cash award to Dr. Lulua. Thank you, Madam. And now, for the best outgoing student of the year 2021, we have Dr. Marjan Abdul Nasir. We request Rajendran sir, a respected principal, to hand over the memento to Dr. Marjan. Thank you, sir. We also request Dr. Sri Jain, sir, medical superintendent, to hand over the cash prize to Dr. Marjan. Thank you, sir. We would like to express a sincere gratitude to Dr. Sadish sponsoring this award every year. We request a beloved HOD, Devi Madam, to hand over the memento to Rajendran, sir. Thank you, madam. Next, we invite Dr. P. Sugadan, sir, Professor and former head of the Department of Dermatology, Government Medical College, Kodikot, to deliver the keynote address. Dr. P. Sugadan is the most admired academician and renowned clinician. His reputed entities, Moody Choder and Piedra, remain afresh in the minds of dermatologists. We welcome you, sir. This meeting is in memoriam to one of our greatest teachers in the, in the field of dermatology, Dr. T. Gopinathan, with whom I had a very long association. And there are several things that I learned from him, of which two things I remember absolutely without any uh, modification is, you should never corner a culprit. However serious his illness, i.e. his mistake may be. Because this happened in, a, in our department where one of the non-medical junior employees was caught doing some stupid thing in the ports of his profession as a social worker. So I was sure he will get beaten up for it because this mistake was so severe. And Dr. Govinad was so angry, but he did not do anything. He just caught him by his shirt and told him, what you have done is unpardonable and you will have to take the necessary punishment. But he did not take anything else professionally on the, on the, about it. He reported the matter to the director of health services, who was his classmate and friend, Dr. Belliraman. And the person was transferred straight away out of the department. I asked him why. Why didn't you take a more severe action on him? Because the mistake was absolutely unpardonable. But then he said, see, when you catch a culprit, and you know that he has done a mistake, you should never corner him. Never corner a subordinate, however serious a mistake may be. He should give a little Adam, leave for him to come out of it. If you corner him, he will come out fighting. Then you will, both of you will be in trouble. That is a very useful lesson I learned. As an head of the department, he had several other uh, options, but he let him go. Without taking any serious punishment, he was transferred out. The second thing which I never forget is his punctuality to the department. If he is working, he will be on his chair at exactly at 8 a.m., maybe a little earlier. And if he was working fully, he never used to leave early unless it is an absolute necessity. He was always in the department and he was compassionate to his colleagues, junior colleagues and to the students. However much he may appear angry on, a, okay, on occasions, it was always followed by a soothing action. These two things I learned from him and I hope I did not hurt you, any of you, as <laughs> during my career. It was not 
easy to handle a, a, a large number of people with varying tastes and dislikes but i hope i managed without much of problem and i i still remember the date and the the time and i, I spent with the, all of you and he had introduced another thing a dinner meeting in the house of each staff member on by rotation it did work for three or four times but then it naturally stopped otherwise it was a absolutely free for all time you know doctor i remember doctor kandhari who was a teacher of extremely strict discipline he was a major in the army but in a meeting in a informal meetings which he had together he will sing he will crack jokes and he will not pretend that he is the head of the department he is just one of the just like an elder brother he is absolutely free that attitude he also studied in institute you know doctor under doctor kangari so we that he my not not only for us our teachers don't die they live through maybe you will copy a, an example or a pattern of behavior from the teacher unconsciously which others may imitate if they find it attractive so this goes on and on and being a teacher my class colleagues who went into general practices and uh, other practices made sufficient wealth which i could not and only by a stroke of luck i applied for a job in saudi arabia dr gobin i told dr gobin that i am applying i just send an application that's all nothing more and he said if you are serious about it you should send them your bio data i said i don't know sir this is only a, a, just a new sort of thing there is nothing official about it so i don't think this is this is serious but to my surprise i was called for an interview in kochi and i was straight away selected then i learned that the man behind this was one dr ikbal a m ikbal who was my student earlier in the trivandrum medical college and then holding a very high post in the national hospital so there are people whom you like there are people whom you will cult- you know cultivate long time associations but people in the department of dermatology in calicut medical college are so dear to me because i spend most of my time here I spend only one and a half years in trivandrum and three years in kota the rest of my professional career was all in medical college calicut and i hope i have cultivated collected a large number of friends who continue to carry the traditional ways of teaching and uh, interactions thank you for giving me an opportunity to bring to your attention the great man dr t take part gopinath as he was called i still remember him thank you thank you sir we request devi madam to hand over the memento to sugathan sir thank you madam this year's prestigious alumni oration award has been conferred to dr b safia madam professor and former head of the department of dermatology government medical college korikod dr b safia madam is a skillful clinician and a benevolent teacher she completed her graduation and post graduation from government medical college korikod and retired as professor department of dermatology calicut medical college As a token of our love and honor we request Dr Devi Madam to present the Ponada scroll and the oration award to Safia Madam To be remembered as a good teacher by some students is an honor To be remembered as a good teacher by all students is a coveted and unique honor Dr B Safia or Safia Madam as she is fondly called has endured herself to her multitude of students with her sagacity wisdom and humility 
Dr. B. Safir was born to Mr. Bava and Mrs. Patuti on 17th July 1946 at North Parvur, Ernakulam, as the eldest of eight siblings. Her schooling and early childhood were in Tamil Nadu. She is an alumnus of St. Mary's School, Coimbatore. She did her pre-degree and pre-medicine from St. Therese's and Maharaja's College, Ernakulam, respectively. Dr. Safiya completed her MBBS, DVD and MD from Government Medical College, Kurikur. Incidentally, she belongs to the ninth undergraduate and the second postgraduate batch of the Dermatology Department, Calicut. Dr. Safiya started her professional career as tutor in Government Medical College, Kurikur, as early as 1973 and has subsequently worked in all the government medical colleges of Kerala in different cadres. She retired as Professor and Head of the Department of Dermatology, Government Medical College, Calicut, in 2002. She was the Professor and Head of Dermatology at MES Medical College, Perindalmana, from 2007 to 2016, post-retirement. She also had a stint in Saudi Arabia, working in the Ministry of Health. Dr. Safiya has special interests in acne and vitiligo. She had started an acne clinic in Government Medical College, Kurikot, and pioneered punch grafting and alternate medicine in vitiligo. Other fields of interest in dermatology include genital ulcer disease, which was her thesis topic as well, Dermatitis in coconut climbers, hand eczema, PRP in leg ulcers, to name a few. Dr. Safir is married to Dr. MBI Mummy, a well known physician and diabetologist of Calicut, who passed away in October 2020. She has two children, Rafiq, an engineer, and Rasia, a pediatrician. At present, she is living in Calicut with her son and family. Her hobbies include listening to music and reading. She was also an active sports person, an athlete and basketball player, and a member of the Calicut Medical College team. Her students will always cherish her classes, which were a judicious mix of academic wisdom, quiet humor, and quick wit. Empathy to patients, innate simplicity, kindness to fellow humans, and dignified demeanor are Madam's core qualities which are worthy of emulation, making Dr. Safiya an iconic teacher. May the God Almighty shower his choicest blessings on Dr. Safiya and family today and every day. It's our privilege and honor to invite our beloved Safiya Madam to deliver the alumni oration of 2021. Respected uh, principal, Dr. Rajendran, the chief guest, Dr. P. Sugadhan, the organizer, chairperson of this uh, seminar, Dr. Devi, dear delegates and friends. A very good morning to one and all. I thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity. I have selected a topic, the Charcot foot early diagnosis and management of the acute phase. Jean Martin Charcot, the famous French neurologist, described the disease in 1868 in some cases of Tebis dorsalis. The condition is also known as Charcot's arthropathy or Charcot's neuroarthropathy. Association with diabetes mellitus was described by Jordan in 1936. Since then, Diabetes mellitus is the most common association of Charcot's arthropathy and is considered one of the late manifestations of diabetes with peripheral neuropathy. The condition is defined as a progressive degenerative disease of the joints and bones of the lower limbs, leading to deformity and ulceration and ultimately may need amputation. The other joints involved are the spine, the hip, the knees and the wrist. The incidence of Charcot's arthropathy in diabetes mellitus is very low, one to two percent, while it increases to 13 to 35 percent when the patient is 
suffering from peripheral neuropathy also. The pathogenesis of the disease is explained on the basis of the popular theories, uh, one by Charcot called the French theory, and the other by German workers, Folkman and Virchow. And now we have another theory, the third one, the vascular theory, uh, incorporated by Edmonds et al. in 1982. The subject of pathophysiology and pathogenesis of Charcot's arthritis is a subject of great interest and uh, many uh, in research work is uh, in progress. The, to summarize, the uh, consensus is that in a neuropathic uh, joint, which is uh, subjected to microtrauma, leads to all the pathology. For want of time, I will not go into the details of the pathophysiology and pathogenesis and go straight to the clinical diagnosis of Charcot's arthropathy. The early presentation is an inflamed foot in a patient who is suffering for a long time with diabetes and it is uncontrolled and is also having peripheral neuropathy. So the clinical diagnosis is to Dif uh, differentiate it from other conditions that can present with the uh, inflamed foot, like uh, infections, cellulitis, osteomyelitis, other conditions that produce inflamed joints like rheumatoid arthritis or gout. In this connection, a uh, review report by Mozart at L. Mozart from Kansas gives a step by step diagnostic method which he calls the flow chart, and it is useful as a guide. On examination, the foot is swollen, uh, erythematous, and it is relatively painless. And uh, there is a rise in temperature, which is uh, showing a difference of two to six degrees uh, centigrade from the opposite side, which is uninvolved. Usually it is unilateral, and there may or may not be a history of uh, recent injury to the foot. Peripheral neuropathy is confirmed by the simple tests of uh, testing for sensations by the monofilament uh, brush uh, using the uh, knee hammer and the tuning fork. These are the best, uh, best uh, ways to clinically diagnose peripheral neuropathy. At this stage, the patient needs no uh, extensive investigations can rule out uh, systemic involvement and also rule out if the patient has excessive blood uh, sugar or he is out of uh, control of the blood sugar by doing uh, tests like the TC, DC, ESR, C-reactive protein and a and, uh, test for HbA1c. Then moving on to other investigations, we have the plain X-ray and the MRI. The plain X-ray will not show any change during the first phase of uh, acute inflamed foot. For clinical purpose, we can uh, de describe this uh, findings as an acute one and are occurring as a chronic one. The clinical cause of the disease is uh, acute for the first uh, three to five weeks. It is called latent or inactive or chronic on the two weeks or three weeks to it can extend up to six months or two to three years, in which case the bone damage has already occurred and the bone is in a healing mode. It is interesting to note that uh, the earliest changes occur in the MRI rather than in the plain X-ray. The X-ray may show evidence of uh, fracture of small bones or uh, edema of the bones, while in the MRI you can see the changes occurring in and around the joints, the subluxation, the deformities like uh, loss of the arch of the foot, or even changes that have been described in textbooks like the sucked candy 
uh, appearance or the penicillin cup deformity or the other deformities like the rock bottom foot. All these make their appearances in the early phase. So the early diagnosis is very important if you want to prevent the progress of the disease to the mutilating stages. The clinical findings can be correlated with the radiological findings and uh, it has been classified by several workers to include the anatomical and the deformities also. So the earliest uh, classification was by Pike and Holtz and the others uh, who described the classification are Brodsky, uh, Sanders and uh, Frickenberg, Sella Bartet, and more recently Dr. Holmes et al. The classification was uh, in stages called uh, by Roman numbers one to five, while uh, Holtz et al. introduced the stage uh, zero also to include what he called the prodromal changes. This occurred according to him even before the inflamed phase clinically presented. So he says it is important to screen patients with diabetes and peripheral neuropathy to elicit this stage so that early intervention can prevent the progress to a full-fledged uh, arthritis. Andreas et al. from uh, Zurich, uh, Switzerland, has uh, reported a pictorial review in which uh, the stages of uh, MRI and X-ray are depicted and it can be used as a guide. To find out the stage zero or the prodromal stage, there are some patients who have at-risk characteristics, at-risk to development of Charcot's arthropathy, and these include uncontrolled diabetic patients with neuropathy, and those who are obese have other comorbidities like uh, hypertension or a coronary artery disease, who are alcoholics or use uh, tobacco, and those with other diseases like renal failure or on treatment for dialysis, or the, who have undergone a surgery or uh, transplantation or more recent uh, in, in the trauma to the ankle or foot. These are all candidates who should be screened. These uh, patients in stage zero clinically will have a mild swelling of the midfoot and they may not have a erythema or the inflamed foot. They will have a, no deformity and they will also be asymptomatic. MRI, the earliest sign is uh, bone bruise, which is described as a damage to the cartilage of the joints and they may have minimal effusion or a subluxation of uh, the joints. In this uh, connection, I would like to mention a report which uh, was uh, from Amrita Institute of Kochi, where they have uh, subjected patients with diabetes and peripheral neuropathy to X-ray evaluation and they discovered a ratio of uh, incidence of 4.9% of uh, Charcot's arthropathy in patients who had only the radiological features. Clinically, they had no evidence of Charcot's arthropathy. Having diagnosed uh, Charcot's arthropathy and uh, staged it, either stage one or stage zero, the management begins with the patient education. The chronic nature of the disease, the need for long-term treatment, and the importance of compliance have all to be explained to the patient. If neglected, the chance of the disease progressing to ulcerations and the need for amputation will all be explained to the patient. An informed and motivated patient will give 
compliance and it will, the treatment will be successful. The next step in uh, management is uh, referral to a center where a multi-speciality approach is followed. For example, the plastic surgeon, the surgeon, the physician, and the podiatrist, and the per persons concerned in making the uh, orthotics and the footwear are all available under one roof. One such uh, institute that I came across is the Creative Plastic Surgery Group, which is functioning in uh, Kolkod District Cooperative Hospital for the last one decade. Most important uh, step in the acute inflamed foot uh, is to give it rest and uh, offload the weight from the involved foot. So immobilization of the foot and joint. So these are best done in a hospital setup. So the initial one to two days are uh, the patient is admitted with bed rest, elevation of foot and application of uh, glycerin or magnesium sulfate uh, creams. And uh, the patient is uh, instructed to normalize his blood sugar also. Analgesics, antibiotics and uh, other non-steroidal or steroids are not uh, indicated in this condition. After the edema subsides, the patient's uh, foot is put in a cast, the total contact cast, which is applied up to the knee and below the on the plantar aspect also, and it is uh, left to uh, heal. Uh, I mean, it is allowed to harden, and uh, he has to continue with the avoidance of weight bearing and walking. After four weeks, the cast is modified into a walking cast that can be cut and modeled by experts to produce a walking cast. The second uh, choice is to buy a diabetic uh, air cast, which is available and uh, it can be patient friendly and it can be used throughout the day and it can be removed at night so that the patients uh, feel comfortable. This uh, procedure of offloading, avoidance of walking and uh, treatment for the other comorbidities should continue for uh, six months to two years or three years. And this is the time the bone is healed and it will clinically and radiologically show evidence of healing, like uh, resorption of the bones and uh, uh, coalescence of the fractures, consolidation and arthrodesis. Sometimes uh, bone abnormalities like exostosis and the deformities and uh, the anatomical uh, deformities uh, will persist, which may need surgical intervention. This is done only after the foot has healed. This again can be demonstrated by radiological findings. So the importance of screening or radiological findings is very important in the management of Shakwa's arthropathy. The ideal time for removal of this uh, offloading devices and for the patient to move on to a footwear, which is custom made, is when the radiological findings show there is no edema in the joint or in the bones. The idea of putting the foot, uh, keeping the foot immobilized and using the offloading methods is to have a foot that is not deformed or one that is not having any ulcer and it is in a planting grade position to uh, be moved into a appropriate footwear. This may take three years, so it is going to be a very tedious process, both for the patient and for the persons concerned in giving health care.
about the medical treatment at this stage, we have some drugs which are found to be influencing or acting on the bone healing. For example, uh, biphosphonates, calcitonin, parathormone hormone, vitamin K, denosumab, TNF-alpha inhibitors. These are not uh, routinely used, but uh, have some role in uh, reducing the inflamed stage and also arresting the progress to the more complicated cases in the acute arthropathy. These drugs have undergone randomized uh, controlled trials with the placebo in several centers and found to be useful. These are mainly indicated for persons with the osteoporosis, that is usually ladies with the menopausal osteoporosis. A few words about the normalization of blood sugar. Uh, with consultation with the physician and the diabetes uh, specialist, we can control the blood sugar and keep it under normal ranges throughout the day. That is by using of diet and uh, insulin or and oral hypoglycemic agents. And another thing I want to say is about the lifestyle changes that have to be undertaken during this period and avoidance of uh, stress and use of what we call antioxidants to counter the metabolic uh, stress that can be induced and many diseases for example uh, even old age and diabetes and the peripheral neuropathy because of the drugs that they are given for the treatment they can have uh, what's called oxidative stress and uh, depletion of the essential antioxidants for this uh, we have to modulate the diet and also take supplements so in clinical practice we use a lot of supplements so ideal ones should be selected for these patients a list of drugs depleting the you know, necessary vitamins and the antioxidants is given in a report by Benjamin et al. So that can be used as a reference guide. The most uh, common drugs or the antioxidants that we have to replace are, for example, glutathione, uh, alpha amino lipoic acids, nacetylcysteine, vitamin K and vitamin B12 and folic acid, so these are all available in a single capsule form called the Red Ox Plus. Other local varieties may also be available in the market. In summary, acute Shakos arthropathy is no longer a clinical challenge. The motto I want to say is be aware of the condition, diagnose it early and intervene so that you can prevent the development of Shakos arthropathy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam, for drawing attention to a much neglected topic and for the excellent presentation.